I'm just curious. The name is very provocative. I'm sure people listening are well aware of magical ritual in general, the pentagram. Where does the order of nine angles get its name? It comes from their symbol. So they have this order of nine angles. People have, there's like, was a ritual in the temple of Set about the ritual of nine angles. According to the founder or Mayat, it is, and you'll see that on the cover of my book, this kind of uh, cross hatched or cross line. It's the seven planets. And then also there, they believe that there are portals into kind of like this a causal realm. And the not two of those angles in that symbol are portals into some other realm. So they think that they can presence or actually be, I would call it possessed uh, by these entities. There's 21 dark gods that are very similar maybe to uh, HP Lovecraft's dark gods. But they they write in their books like they distinguish with they distinguish themselves from it. But they actually presence through these portals in the sky, and everything happens at night. So they go out and look at a specific constellation, and try to do some ritual. And uh, so that's kind of the nine angle concept. And what do you think about this? Do you think it's just some superstition or wishful thinking on their part? It's hard for me to believe because so many people dedicate their lives to reading the old grimoires and going through multiple orders and all of their literature and then forming their own orders. And there is a case to be made that it's all bullshit because of something like Scientology. Like it seems like he took uh, occultism and spun it off into a blackmail gathering intelligence religion sort of thing. And there doesn't really seem to be a ton of actual practical magic there, although we're not in that club. But this belief that there are these portals to an acausal realm, do you think there's some merit to that? Is this something in the structure of reality that a person can tap into? Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe it's dark. But do you think this is possible or more superstition? I think that the, uh, the power of belief is really incredible. So if you believe in whatever it is, it could be it. I think that I've talked to other mad, mad people who are involved in ritual magic, ceremonial magic, of which this group has ceremonial magical aspects to it. And they say it's real. So they believe that there's something beyond the five senses that they're in contact with or, or drawing power from and trying to get correspondences and do this kind of thinking. So I think uh, you'd have to talk to some of these people in the ONA. I've talked to a few. I've had a former... Adam Waffen member actually on my show, but you'd have to talk to them to see if they think it works. I think they think it works. I think they believe, I believe that Crowley thought he was, he was getting magical power from his rituals and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think the evidence is there. And I've talked to other guys that are involved in the magical world presently. And they say that these rituals and things that they do, they provide them with their energy or whatever, whether it's like, what do they say? You know, you, you, will it into existence this kind of idea i think maybe there is some some power to that i i, I don't know i don't practice magic so <laughs> i wouldn't know but they that's what I, they say mm -hmm. yeah well a lot of occultists have commented on the theatrics of a lot of these rituals especially if you go back a long time and the theatrics could be seen to play a role in getting you out of baseline consciousness and reinforcing that belief. Cause if we're dealing with the reverse placebo effect, you would need to believe it. And it's a catch 22 cause you can't believe it until you've seen some kind of evidence of it. But if you get in the robes and you get the candles going, like you can kind of uh, push yourself towards belief uh, a little earlier, I would say. And it makes sense that it could be a belief thing, a reverse placebo effect, given how many different orders there are and how many different systems there are. And people who get engaged in those systems say it works, but it's not just one thing. So how do you explain that dozens and dozens of magical systems that are all completely separate with their own rituals and their own gods work? Well, this right. Uh, all over history, all over human history, this whole ceremonial magic has been going all the way back to Assyria, right, or the Babylonian, which this group, the Order of Nine Angles, alleges, you know, that's really the kind of like holy grail of occultists is to trace your magic all the way back to Babylon. 
before Egypt, right? But if you look at all these cultures and all this stuff, there's always a shaman. There's always something. Even the Bible has it. Moses was in contest, contest with Yanis and Yambras. This is uh, there that, you know, they're fighting with the snakes. That This is this is biblical belief is all of these, uh, you know, extra sensory events are happening with these magicians. So uh, I think it's that in the, uh, and my other research in Children of the Book Beast, you can hear uh, from kind of a modern guy, a modern, a guy who defined himself as a warlock, which is uh, Kenneth Anger, who was friends with Bobby Boussoulet. And Bobby Boussoulet said the guy had power. Like he literally had power. Like he was seeing visions and all kinds of crazy things were happening. I don't know if it was the uh, impact of drugs or LSD, which is, it could be actually perceived as kind of a magical event in itself. But Bobby Boussoulet said anger could like command spirits and have visions and things like that. So that's just another thing. But I think that this, my point is, is like this whole magical thinking or magical events really permeate almost all civiliz all, all civilizations back to recorded history. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's all good information. There was one thing in there when it comes to their beliefs and practices where you're talking about the order of nine angles and you mentioned shape shifting, you say what is especially interesting is that the O nine a associates the mage and to a lesser extent, the master slash mistress of the dark arts with skill in shape shifting by which they mean not the mythological ability of a living human to somehow transform oneself. What do, what do they mean by shape shifting? Uh, Obviously, there's the skinwalker practice, so a lot of people think this is an actual thing shamans can do, despite how over the top it sounds, how illogical it sounds. But what did they mean? That's a good question. I have like the, the concepts of the order of nine angles in there, and there's a lot of different concepts. But shape shifting and scrunching are kind of like two of these weird world words I was kind of talking about their language. But I think that they think that they can actually kind of change their through uh through these dark gods coming in is actually change their outer looks and things like that so that's uh that's what i think i mean i have to go back and re reread but mm -hmm. they can somehow transform themselves into vampires or some of these dark gods to do the sinner sinister sorcery that they talk about right and then you go on to say of course the most disturbing aspect is their open promotion of human sacrifice which they refer to as calling and we talked about how there are some people that have gotten caught up in this or were heavily engaged in it who then did commit real crimes but is there more to say about their promotion of human sacrifice do they describe why a person would do it what benefit there is to such a thing and has the founder, David Myatt, ever been convicted or proven that he committed some kind of sacrifice? No, no my, to my knowledge, has not been convicted or anything. Um, but their goal is they have a long-term goal to create a Homo Galacticus, right? And so they are transforming Homo sapiens into some other galactic race, really. So it's almost like Nazism. You're creating a new race. And things that are impeding that that formation of this dark um, empire that they're trying to create are homo hubriati, people who are arrogant or people who, for one reason or another, have some kind of character flaw. And those are the people they select for the offer or sacrifice, according to their doctrines, and then secretly kill them or agree to kill them. So their people are tested like that. And... How many people have been, you know, caught doing that? Not many. There's been a few. There's one guy who, uh, his name was Daniel Hussein, who made a pact through another guy whose name is, his fake name is E.A. Coetting, who's associated with the Order of Nine Angles and is apparently written for them through uh, one of the Nexians. But he, Daniel Hussein went out into a park in the night and made a blood pact that he was going to kill somebody and get away with it. Mary Owen a thing and went out and killed two girls celebrating a birthday party. And this is, this was in the last couple of years. So that's a, that's a real one where one guy's been caught and there's questions about his sanity, which is why they haven't sent to, I don't know if they, it's maybe they sentenced him this year, but uh, EA weddings bull become a living God. He got kicked off of like uh, social media because of his association with Danny Hussein. And it shows the international character of it too, because 
EA Coetting is in Utah and Daniel Hussein is, you know, in, um, in London. So you can see this kind of international contact, but that's just one thing where people really get caught. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you, you, there's other ones. There's been, there was a case in Russia where they lured somebody out into a park and she was killed. This is something that I don't think is even in my book. It was a recent case, but they were supposedly ONA associated. So there may be other cases. I mean, the thing is, is that this group is supposed to, you're supposed to do everything in secret, right? And some of this, they don't like wear the ONA patch around like maybe a Mason does. So you don't know really who's out there uh, acting on these, these kind of dark ideas, yeah. Right. And if there is some kind of power to it, to their pact with these dark entities, you would think that the benefit would be the not getting caught part. So that opens up a lot of speculation as to how deep it really goes, how many people are participating and how many murders can be attributed to the people making these dark pact pacts. There is one one thing I can say, Greg, is that there's this whole section on these Nexians. There's proof that these cells are in all a lot of major cities all throughout Europe and the US. And so people are practicing it. I mean, you can go onto Facebook and see these Nexians. I think they're still there. So that shows that there are certain cells of uh, th these kind of these actors. Can you believe it, people? A video clip and a peek into how that sweet THC sausage is made. For some people, I'm sure it's nice to put a face to the name, so I started making clips that are a little more YouTube-friendly than the full show tends to be. Get the full show on any podcasting platform. I prefer to keep it audio only, so we have a more decentralized distribution for a controversial show, and also so I can edit out the ums and ahs and barking dogs and all the things that happen when a person records in their home environment. And then if you really like the show, you can sign up for THC Plus, and instead of one-hour interviews, you get the full two-hour interview for just eight bucks. I think that's a better deal, more of a win-win than asking you to support the show by booking a therapy session or buying generic Viagra. It's getting weird out there, folks. So just go to the thehiresidechats.com or click the link at the top of any set of show notes, and all your wildest dreams will come true. All right? All right. The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood.